Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to Indian Trail Presbyterian Church's virtual worship service this day. We thank you for joining us and pray God's blessings upon us as we worship wherever we are in the unity of Christ's Holy Spirit. I just want to say a word to you about next week. Um, I'm going to be on vacation for a week uh, attending my son's wedding, so there will not be a YouTube version of worship next Sunday. Um, we will live stream our worship service on Sunday morning on Facebook, as we generally do, and uh, you can find us on our Facebook page, Indian Trail, uh, Presbyterian Church Facebook page, and view it there if you'd like. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, I have a word for our young people today, and it's actually not a word for the young people, but a, a request. Um, I have an idea. The prayers of the people that I'm going to use today in worship is one written by a Presbyterian minister named Anne Marie Montgomery, and um, it's actually a prayer that was originally prayed by a group of young people, a group of youth for perhaps a youth Sunday or something in the church, and they prayed the different parts of the prayer, and it gave me an idea that uh, perhaps, even though we're not really all together quite yet, uh, that we could write a prayer as the younger folks in our congregation. And so what I'd like to encourage you to think about doing is to sit down in, in the next week or two, uh, find some time to sit down and, and you can uh, con compose some contributions to a prayer. Uh, now this could be done in several, one of several ways. If you, if you like to write things like poetry or, or prose, you can write a prayer out, you can write it in a, poem, a form of a poem, you can write it out, or if, you just, if you're more of a list maker and you want to list some things that you pray for, some, some joys and things you're thankful for, or some, or some current concerns that you have, uh, you might try to sit down and do that. I'm going to be uh, contacting some of you through email and, 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 and phone and, and encouraging you to do that, but my idea is that we would take all these different prayers and once we see what we have, we see what God has has uh, gathered uh, from among us, uh, we might take some of them and use them individually in worship services, or we might combine some of them to, into larger prayers. And perhaps as we are able, more able to come together uh, in person in worship, uh, maybe we could pray these together as a congregation and you might lead us some. So um, anyway, I encourage you to think about that, to give it some time if you have time and begin composing some of your own prayers uh, that we might use together. Well, let us turn now to our scripture and word for the day. Um, our scripture is from Mark's gospel, chapter four, verses 30 to 32. It's, a, it's just a three verse parable that Jesus told about the kingdom, about a mustard seed. But, but before we read it, I want to be sure we understand which mustard seed we're talking about. You see, Jesus, on a number of occasions in the Gospels, is, uh, is related to have used the mustard seed as an example. Uh, the mustard seed is a very, very small seed, and uh, he uses the image of the mustard seed in a couple of different ways in the Scriptures. Uh, the one way that's really common, commonly known is when Jesus compares our faith to a mustard seed. And Jesus says, if we just have the tiniest bit of faith, if we just have the faith the size of a mustard seed, just that much, we can move mountains. And in that instance, Jesus is talking about, when he uses the mustard seed as an image, he's talking about our faith, the faith we have. That's not how Jesus uses the image of the mustard seed in this particular passage we're going to read this morning. In this passage, Jesus uses the image of the mustard seed to talk about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. So let us listen now to a word from God from Mark chapter 4, verses 30 through 32, this parable of Jesus. Let us see what the Spirit has to say to the church. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. Yet, 
when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. This is indeed the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which is so tiny when it is scattered on the ground, but which grows up into one of the greatest of shrubs so that birds of the air can make nests in its branches. As I've read this parable this week and contemplated it, I have begun to ponder the mustard seeds of the kingdom that have been scattered in my own life. The mustard seeds that have affected who, who I am and, and my vision of the kingdom of God, my understanding of the kingdom of God, how I've witnessed that in my own life, but also in the lives of others. And I want to share some of those mustard seeds with you today. The first one I want to share is perhaps the uh, earliest recognition or remembrance that I have of a mustard seed of the kingdom in my life. Uh, my memory is that I was about four or five years old, and I was standing in the vestibule of our church in Wadesboro, First Presbyterian Church, and, and we had two vestibules, much like we do here at Indian Trail. And I was so I was standing in, in that far um, left vestibule for the preacher, but right vestibule for the congregation. And we, church was over. We were all leaving church. And my memory is of looking up as I shook the hand of our preacher, looking up at Dr. Cheshire and saying, I'm going to be a preacher just like you. Now, two things. Number one, I don't even know if that's my memory, if it's a real memory. Um, I've been told this story before, so I don't know if maybe I've heard this story a few times and I have sort of uh, created this visual memory in my mind. It seems real enough. So, but the truth is, I don't know if, you know, how, how much of that is it actually happened exactly in that way. Um, I know it happened in some way. Uh, but the second thing is also every time a child or a young person or a young adult even says, this is what I want to do when I grow up, that's not necessarily a sign from God. Everything we say we want to do is not necessarily a calling for life. Um, for example, I have at different times in my childhood, I talked about being a wildlife biologist. Um, I talked about being a writer and writing books. Um, uh, when I was, uh, getting ready to go off to college and trying to decide where to go, I even considered at one point NC State University and being a field turf management specialist. And then when I was in college and worried that I was about to flunk out, I considered dropping out and starting a chimney sweep business. So everything we decide we might want to do in life is not a calling. Everything is not a sign from God. However, that memory, uh, that event has stayed with me through my life, stayed with me all through my growing up and my becoming a young adult, a college student, uh, discerning what I was called to do with my life. That little mustard seed, that seed of the kingdom of God. And the tree that grew from this seed was a calling which once I, I discerned it and acknowledged it and accepted it, in my last year of college, it's a calling I've never questioned, really. Some of the specifics of the calling sometimes I wonder about, but the calling itself is not one I have questioned. That's my earliest uh, sense of a mustard seed of the kingdom in my life. Uh, the next one I want to tell you about is not something that a uh, seed that was planted in my own life, but one I, I observed as having been planted and bearing fruit in the life of someone else. When I was in college, I worked for the summers in a warehouse in Anson County. And uh, one of the first days I was at work in this warehouse, I was warned that there was a man who worked there named Howard, who was who took care of, the, he was a janitor and took care of the outside physical plant of the, of the uh, warehouse and the company. And, and I was warned that he was crazy. He picks on everybody, gives everybody a hard time, they said, and he especially likes new people. So the first time he sees you, you might as well get ready for it. He's going to give you a hard time. And sure enough, one of the first days I was there, uh, mid-morning or so, I heard a commotion up at the other end of the warehouse. And I looked up, 
And, and sure enough, there was a man coming down through the warehouse, walking down through the warehouse, and he was giving everybody a hard time. He was yelling at people. He was saying words that I can't say in church. And, and pe most people were just laughing at him as he kept going. And yes, indeed, when he saw me and recognized a new face, he made a beeline. And I mean, he started strutting down through that warehouse and his, and he was scary looking. His eyes were about this big and they were crazy looking eyes. And he had this shockingly white curly hair coming out all around his hat. And he was just as hard as he could coming right toward me. And he walked right up into my face and got right up in my face. And he said, well, he said a lot of things I can't repeat, but, but then he said, boy, who's your daddy? And I said, uh, Ash Ratliff. And he said, does your daddy love you? And I said, uh, yeah. He said, has your daddy ever hit you? And I said, and right now I want to tell you that I, I have no memory of my daddy ever hitting me, and none whatsoever. But somehow in that split second, I knew that if I said no, he was not going to believe me and the results might not be good for me. And so I lied. I said, yeah, my daddy's hit me. And he said, well, if your daddy loves you and he hits you, he said, what do you think I'm going to do to you? Because I don't care anything about you. And then everything changed. At that moment, he visibly, his body visibly relaxed and he took a step back and he looked at me and he said, and a smile grew on his face and he said, Ash Ratliff is your daddy. And I said, yeah. He said, he put his arm around me and he said, boy, come with me. And we walked down to the warehouse and he began to tell me a story. Howard had a hard life growing up and evidently when he was about 14, 15 years old, his daddy disappeared, his mother was very sick and he had to drop out of school and go to work. And the story goes that he was kind of running a service station there in town. And he told me, he said, I didn't have any friends. He said, nobody liked me, but I, I didn't even have time for friends if they had. He said, all the older boys picked on me constantly. He said, but your daddy, he said one day they were coming through the gas station to get gas and they were heading down to Rockingham to the races. And your daddy said to me, Howard, get in the car, come with us. He said, your daddy was kind to me when nobody else was and I'll never forget it. Now, I doubt my teenage father knew he was farming that day. I doubt he knew he was scattering mustard seed, seeds of the kingdom of God, but a seed was scattered. And from that seed of the kingdom, the tree that grew was the experience of one lonely young man being accepted and welcomed. And it was a tree that bore fruit in the future of another young man being accepted and welcomed. Seeds of the kingdom. The last seed of the kingdom I want to share with you that I experienced uh, in my life was um, the, the first congregation I ever served. It was a Sunday morning and I stood up in church to worship. Now this congregation was a lot like a lot of Presbyterian churches. Every, most people who gathered there on a Sunday morning looked a lot alike. Uh, they all sort of understood themselves to be kind of the same kinds of people. And that was just the reality of that congregation. Uh, and on, But on that Sunday morning, I stood up to worship. And nobody had orchestrated this. None of, nobody had planned any of this. But on that Sunday morning, I stood up in the pulpit and we were singing our first hymn. And I looked out and I realized I had a glimpse of the kingdom of God. Because on that particular Sunday morning, we had a number of new people show up for worship. Right down in front, there was a member of our congregation who worked in a, in a group home for intellectually disabled adults. And she had brought four or five residents from that home who were singing with all their heart that morning. Over on this side, back in the corner, there was a new family worshiping with us that day. And it was easy to see a new family that showed up in that congregation because it was a fairly small congregation. But the other difference here this morning was that it was an African-American family. They had just moved to town a block away from the church. They had been Presbyterians in their previous 
town and they had come to the nearest Presbyterian church to worship that day. On that same Sunday, sitting down toward the front on this side was a, a woman from another congregation that I knew to be very, very poor. She would have been called dirt poor in that community. She literally did not know day to day if she would have enough to eat. We didn't have a lot of poor people in that congregation on a regular basis. And then I noticed that in the back on the right, there was John who was, that wasn't a surprise. John was always there every Sunday. And, and you know, once or twice, once a month or once every other month, he would bring his 12 uh, year old grandson with him to church. But what was different this day was that sitting with John and his grandson was his daughter. His daughter, who about a dozen years before was in high school and got pregnant, an unwed mother, and who the story goes had not been to church since then. Somehow, she got the message, whether it was meant to be conveyed or not, whether the church, anybody in the church said anything out loud or whether it was just a sense she got, or maybe it was her own fear, but somehow she had gotten the message that she as an unwed mother didn't belong in the church. And for over a dozen years, she had not come to church until that day. And I looked out. And I thought, this is a glimpse of the kingdom. It was a seed, a mustard seed of the kingdom being sown that day. And the tree which grew from that seed, I don't know. I mean, I know within me, it just helped sort of solidify a vision of the kingdom of God that I have had for a long time, that the kingdom and the church is the manifestation of the kingdom on earth. This is the place where we all ought to be able to come, regardless of whatever divisions and walls we build among ourselves in the world. This is the place where all God's people should be able to come and live together in unity and in love. It solidified that for me, but I don't know what other trees of the kingdom grew that day. I don't know what tree grew up for that group of residents from the adult group home or from the woman who day to day had to struggle to find food or for that new family that didn't come back to our church after that day i don't know what tree of the kingdom grew for that young woman who for the first time in over a dozen years had come back to her home church but i do have a, a conviction enough of a conviction of the power of the seeds of the kingdom to believe that there are trees that grew from that particular seed that day. Earlier this week, I sat on our couch in our family room at home. I was the only one there and it was quiet. And I sat there for about two hours with my head back on the couch with my eyes closed, just thinking, just trying to remember, just trying to recall mustard seeds of the kingdom of God that have been scattered throughout my life. And it was a, it was a joyful, a joyful spiritual exercise. I would encourage you to do the same. What are the seeds of the kingdom that have been sown in your life? Things you perhaps have forgotten that you have to dig up from the, the depths of your, your memory. What are the seeds of the kingdom that have been scattered and what shrubs, what great shrubs have grown up for them, from them? How do they continue to grow? And how have you and others been able to make nests in their shade? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As I alluded in our time with the young people, our prayer today was written by uh, Anne Marie Montgomery, or it is attributed to her. I don't know how it was composed, but it seems to have been a prayer for young people, uh, perhaps, as I said, for a youth Sunday or something. The image here is, um, it, the, the primary image in this prayer is the light of Christ. Uh, symbolized by a candle being lit 
uh, for different reasons uh, for the kingdom of God. Um, let us go now to God in prayer. Wars rage. Countries are laid waste. Will someone light a candle for peace? We are called to embrace diversity and celebrate our differences. And yet we, we are suspicious of one another. Will someone light a candle for unity? Sometimes life seems overwhelming and despair engulfs us. And the hopelessness, the darkness of the hopelessness overwhelms us. Will someone light a candle for hope? We live in a hurting and broken world that needs a touch of comfort. Will someone light a candle for compassion? Depression, loneliness, guilt, envy, greed, anger, hatred, these things represent the brokenness of our lives. Will someone light a candle for wholeness? Money, power, materialism, success, these things seem to rule the day. Will someone light a candle for simple acts of kindness? The world needs a model of a better way. Will someone light a candle for the church of Jesus Christ? In our world where violence creates alienation and separates people, will someone light a candle for the gift of families? The gap between the haves and have-nots grows wider each day, and too many of the world's children die of malnutrition. Will someone light a candle for justice? We judge others by the clothes they wear, the cars they drive, where they live, their age, their color, their beliefs. Will someone light a candle for friendship? Holy God, as we pray for peace, unity, hope, compassion, wholeness, acts of kindness, the church, our families, justice, acceptance, forgiveness, friendship and reconciliation. As we pray for these things, let us remember that we have been shown how to live these things. Will someone light a candle for the word of God that shows us the way? We make these prayers in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we leave this time of worship, Let us take with us the good news that the God who has created us saves us in Jesus Christ and continues to plant seeds of the kingdom of God scattered in throughout our lives. And those seeds continue to grow into great shrubs in which the people of God can make nests in their shade by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.